Okay, I believe we are live. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Sherry Ziller. I am the interim CEO at the Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority. And it is my privilege to um, welcome you to a virtual public meeting tonight. We are here to review and discuss the transit development process surrounding the uh, East Chicago South Shore Station. I am joined tonight by the City of East Chicago leadership. Uh, also joining us are members of the RDA's planning team. And we are all here to discuss the specifics of the potential development around the East Chicago South Shore Station. So before I turn uh, the virtual microphone over to the city of East Chicago, let me begin uh, by setting the stage for this process. The RDA was given the task as part of its establishing legislation to assist in developing and furthering uh, commuter rail in Northwest Indiana as part of a strategy to increase um, the connectivity with Chicago and to grow the economy um, of the region. So the state provided funding and in the 2015 and then again in the 2017 legislative sessions made it very clear that the RDA was to take the lead in uh, financing the rail expansions. Further in 2017, uh, the state tasked the RDA with assisting our municipalities here in Northwest Indiana, in which the stations were situated and provided the um, funding mechanisms to help in planning for and financing their TOD, their transit oriented development. Um, so with that, uh, I believe the next slide should be, yep, the planning entities, thank you. So here I would say during the past two years, uh, the RDA has been meeting with our station area community leaders to understand you know, their own visions and planning concepts for, um, for TOD. So the RDA has pulled together a planning team to assist in these efforts consisting of MKSK, KPMG, and Policy Analytics, all of whom you'll hear from um, throughout the presentation and through the Q&A session towards the end of um, our program tonight. This virtual meeting um, tonight is the next step in the process of bringing um, what we consider a unique set of development tools into play to help grow the Northwest Indiana economy and then to uh, further establish a high quality of life for, for our region. So just as a matter of an update for the rail projects, um, so last year uh, on October 28th, the Federal Transit Administration signed the grant providing the funding to make the Westlake Corridor project a reality. Um, Nick D, so the Northwest Indiana Commuter Transportation District, they're already working with their design and construction teams to begin the four plus years of work to make the Westlake line operational. And then also um, DoubleTrack received their grant providing uh, the federal funds the beginning of this year, beginning of January. So the RDA, um, I would say in convening this meeting tonight, we're moving forward on our own um, separate mission, which is to ensure that the best options for development around the station areas are considered, they're agreed to by the communities, uh, eventually funded and, um, and put into place. So the role of the RDA, you, <clears throat> you can see what's on the screen, but really the role of the RDA is to help communities create more attractive, secure neighborhoods and as we navigate through this process, we really are enabling our communities to compete for the young professionals that um, work in Chicago and to make our communities more attractive for the businesses and people who will work in Indiana. So the RDA, we want to work with you to strengthen your community, to enhance what you love about it and to enhance um, your livability. So whatever your interest is, whether you're a resident, um, a developer, a business owner, community stewards, we are grateful for your willingness to participate in this conversation tonight and look forward to making this a very um, successful development process. So with that, I will hand it over to um, the city of East Chicago. We have uh, Richard Morrisrow. He wears many hats, so I'll let him introduce himself. 
Uh, he'll say a few words on the TDD and the uh, East Chicago South Shore Station. So again, I just want to thank you all for your uh, time and participation tonight. And uh, City of East Chicago, Mr. Morris Rowe, over to you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Richard Morris Rowe. For a number of years, I was city planner. However, now Doug Powers has been in that position the last couple of months and is pleasantly with us this evening. Doug has a lot of experience in Michigan and in the Elkhart area and is already has his feet on the ground trying to pick up where Marino Solorio left off a year and a half ago. I'm currently working in the law department with Carla Morgan, our corporate counsel, but had the opportunity for the last couple of years to work with the Regional Development Authority and to work on this project. The map you have before you uh, has a lot of sites. Notice down at the bottom, we have the, the South Shore Station. You know, East Chicago is the largest station on the South Shore route. More people get on and off at the East Chicago Station than at any other station running from South Bend to downtown. So uh, be proud of ourselves. We have a lot to learn. Aaron Kowalski, and Eric Lucas have a lot of talent as planners, as designers, and as people who have found time to work with, with uh, Sandra Favela, James Porto Latin, Frank Rivera, Jim Bennett, and myself. And now we'd like to turn it over to Eric and uh, give it a lot of attention. There are going to be some uh, slides of this that will be available both in City Hall and in the Pastrick branch of the East Chicago Library. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Richard. I appreciate that introduction. And thank you all for joining us this evening um, to learn a little bit about the, the process, what a TDD is, and, and what we have to share with you tonight for a draft uh, boundary. Um, we have enjoyed the relationship and the collaboration that Richard just mentioned with the city and the staff who have really helped us to understand sort of the nuances of the community and how to best formulate this draft boundary. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about that tonight, but just before we get into that, I wanted to kind of pull back a little bit and look at this in the big picture for a moment, just to set the stage and remind everybody about what an enormous project this really is for the Northwest Indiana region. It does provide, as Sherry mentioned, that critical connectivity into Chicago, faster commute times with the double tracking and the new extension on the Westlake line um, to get people to and from the Chicago metro area into our communities in Northwest Indiana. So there's the anticipation of significant investment, not only in terms of how much is being invested in the corridor and in the rail project itself, but the private investment that's anticipated to occur over time, the amount of new jobs that can be created in Northwest Indiana, and just the general opportunity for economic development across the region. Next slide, please. Um, as, as you likely know, um, we're working primarily, uh, well, this evening we'll focus on the double track, the South Shore Line, um, and that's a, that's a long distance, 25 miles is the project area that we're looking at. That includes second, uh, 16 miles of new second track, which is the, uh, the way that we're Im improving the commute times in and out of Chicago. And this project, uh, in terms of the NICD investment, the, the, the actual train line construction is about $450 million uh, in construction. And that is um, it's quite a substantial investment. The next slide shows the Westlake line, which is of course a new line, doesn't exist today. So new track uh, for nine miles um, headed south to Dyer. And the cost of that line, new line, is about $850 million. So significant public investment to kind of get things going here. And when you put it all together, you see on the next slide, the larger um, network of, of rail and, and the combination of the two lines and the investment is really a once in a generational, maybe even a lifetime opportunity for these communities and for Northwest Indiana. Next slide, please. When we start thinking about uh, transit-oriented development, which is the topic this evening, um, we start to understand 
what happens in communities after this kind of investment occurs from a public investment uh, perspective, we, we begin to look at um, how growth has happened in the past in other communities. And so this slide shows a handful of examples from across the state line into Illinois, where investment in commuter rail stations has occurred over uh, different time periods. And the reason we point this out and, and uh, show this uh, selection of cities is to highlight that uh, communities grow at their own pace. Some communities grow very quickly, others grow a little slower. Um, the type of growth is different from community to community. And really that's a part of working with you to understand your um, trajectory, your goals, what you've set out to achieve so that we can help you get there with the creation of the boundary. We know that East Chicago may grow differently than say Ogden Dunes. Um, and so we want to take into account how that can occur and how we adjust the boundary accordingly. Next slide, please. And so uh, to kind of uh, uh, prep everybody on what we'd like to cover this evening, we're going to hit on four topics. We're going to first talk a little bit about what a transit development district is um, and the boundary process that we're um, undertaking. And then we'll uh, talk more specifically about East Chicago. Um, we'll focus on what we've learned about the community through the collaboration, uh, as Richard mentioned earlier, um, and how that's impacted and influenced the boundary that we want to present out and at the end of the presentation. Next slide. And so um, as we get underway, it's important to point out, and you've seen a couple of pop-ups thus far, um, we, we do have a number of ways that we are encouraging you to interact, not only tonight, but on your own in the future. Um, tonight specifically, there are uh, pop-up boxes that um, will ask you questions that's helping us understand some basics about the audience and your interests. These are the live polls that are happening throughout the presentation. You'll also be able to ask us questions. So at the bottom of the screen, if you click on the Q&A box, you can type questions. We're taking those throughout the evening. We'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so you'll hear your answers. Um, and then you can also go to our website, um, www.nwitdd.com. You're gonna find on that website just a wealth of information about uh, this station area, as well as all the others, if you're interested. Um, you'll be able to dig deeper into the content that we present this evening and sort of learn at your own pace. Uh, you'll be able to find video recordings from this evening's presentation. You can find the Q&A responses as well on the webpage and get a lot of background information about what we're doing. Um, you'll also be able to view uh, what we call the gallery um, that is set up now in City Hall. The gallery is a static version of the content that we're sharing out this evening that is displayed on large uh, printed out boards. You can peruse at your own pace in person, really study the material. There are also ways that you can interact there by doing polls and taking questionnaires um, that help us understand your feedback. And, um, and then uh, all of this content is provided also in Spanish um, format as well. So uh, we will have in the gallery uh, a version that's translated into Spanish. We also on the web page uh, for East Chicago have a toggle that allows you to view the content in Spanish. This presentation will be uploaded to the web page in a couple of days. It will have Spanish subtitles. So please do take advantage of all these opportunities. Also, if you um, know that uh, know somebody who may be interested in learning about the project and isn't able to attend this evening's meeting, please point them to any of these resources so that they can learn and give us feedback. Um, so we appreciate that. Uh, next slide, please. So um, here's what you should know about the TDD uh, uh, boundaries. And TDD, to start off, uh, stands for Transit Development District. And really, the, the process that we're undertaking is to define a boundary. Next slide, please. And that boundary um, really is a, a sort of a, a line on a drawing, but it actually is much more than that. It's a way for us to use economic development tools to support the kind of growth that you would like to see over time in your community. We'll talk about what those tools are here in a moment, but really this is enabling the growth to occur at your rate, your pace, 
the kind of growth that you'd like to see, and it's centered around the station. Next slide, please. It really does sort of help put you on your trajectory for economic growth. So it's important that we get it right. It's important that we understand the areas in the community that are most applicable to be included within the boundary. We'll talk about the kinds of things we can maybe envision within one of these boundaries and as growth does occur later, but it really does complement the kind of growth that you would like to see. And Aaron will go through in a little while the kinds of things that we've taken into account that you've already stated as your goals for our community and that's helped us quite a bit. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we'd like to really clarify up front is you know, what, what is it that a transit development district is and what is it that a transit development district is not? And so you'll hear us talk about this 320 acre um, area. That's the size that one of these boundaries can be. And really it is, as I mentioned ago, a moment ago, an economic development tool to help communities in Northwest Indiana grow. And you'll hear about how we've gone about um, creating this draft boundary that we want to share tonight. This is not new zoning. This is not a comprehensive plan. It's not a new land use plan. This isn't a way of um, you know, taking property through a new domain. We're not working directly with any given developer in this process. Um, we're not trying to promote any single type of development over everything else. And this is not really a, 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 a component of the NICD project. The NICD South Shore project, all the station design, the parking lot layouts, uh, the, the properties that are being acquired as part of the, the project for NICD, that's separate. We're, um, uh, we typically do get questions about the NICD process during these meetings. Those are best answered by NICD. Um, so we'd like to make clear what, what it is we're trying to focus on and what it is we're not doing through this process. Um, and that helps everybody get on the same page. Next slide. So as I mentioned a moment ago, the transit development district is one contiguous area. It has to be connected to the station and it can be no larger than a half square mile, which is about a 320 acre area. Next slide, please. It's important to note that um, we're collaborating extensively with the local communities. We wanna make sure that the boundary suits your long-term vision and needs. Um, also recognizing that ultimately when the boundary is created, the local community um, all, always retains land use and zoning control. That's really important to understand. Um, so this is uh, the RDA assisting in the creation of the boundary as an economic development tool, but the local community retains that control. Next slide, please. And even though we're looking at sort of a standard size for each uh, stationary 320 acres, the shape of that boundary varies dramatically in each community because we want to draw those lines in a strategic fashion. We want to optimize the amount of area for economic development that you would like to see in the community. So we work really closely, and Aaron will walk you through a series of slides that show how we get to the boundary. We work really closely with your community leadership to identify the, the areas that should be included and those that should not be included. So you can see in, on this example, this isn't East Chicago, but you can see in this example how the boundary can be fairly irregular in shape, and that's very common in all the communities that we're working in. Next slide. Um, so the, the economic development tool component of this boundary is captured in this slide. What we're able to do within the boundary is capture the incremental growth in local income and property tax revenues that occur over time within the boundary. And that's really important because once we are able to capture that, we can reinvest those incremental revenues back in to the same district. So it's a tool that allows us to capture, if you're familiar with the concept of a TIF district, a tax increment finance district, um, which enables uh, local communities to capture the incremental growth of property tax, we can do that within this transit development district boundary as well. But an additional feature of the transit development district um, process is to be able to capture the local income tax revenue, the incremental growth of the local income tax as well. So that's an additional feature which really does support additional opportunity for economic development and reinvestment. Uh, next slide, please. And as I mentioned that, I should also point out, this is a question that often does get asked. This isn't a new tax. This isn't raising taxes. 
over what they are today. This is simply capturing incremental growth of taxes as they naturally occur over time. Um, so it's also important to note that this is, the, tonight's meeting is sort of one step in the process of sharing out information. Um, we're sharing out information tonight in the multiple formats that I mentioned earlier. And we're also um, uh, leading up to two public hearings uh, that will occur with the RDA um, and their board of directors. That will lead us to um, being able to get the boundaries approved by the RDA finally, and then um, ultimately to the state budget committee who will officially approve and adopt the state, uh, the, the boundaries. Um, and then the, the districts can then uh, be set. So this is one step in that public process. We have two more steps with the RDA board and then one step with the state budget committee. And of course, as we learn and get feedback from you all this evening, um, we'll incorporate and revise that information to get to those next meetings. So um, we won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but this slide sort of demonstrates the um, ways in which the incremental growth of revenue can be captured and, and how that um, works. It's important to note here that um, if a TDD and a TIF overlap, that the split of those incremental revenues um, is decided upon and agreed upon and negotiated between the RDA and the local redevelopment commission. That's really important to note because in a lot of cases we do see overlap of TIF districts that are already in place in your community with the new TDD that we're creating. And that's uh, not a bad thing. It just means that we need to negotiate how those revenues sort of um, get split over time. Uh, next slide. And that primarily will occur through what we call a memorandum of understanding and the memorandum of understanding is, is sort of a formal document, a legal document actually, that binds the RDA to the local unit of government, in this case, your East Chicago local unit of government to agree upon those things. And it allows for the increment that's uh, collected to be issued in the form of debt obligations, et cetera. And so it's really an important uh, component. It's a next step. We're not at the process yet where the communities and the RDA are working towards the MOUs, uh, but we, we will be getting to that point soon. So it's important to note that this is the next step in the collaboration between the communities and the RDA. The first step, of course, is to look at the boundary and define the optimal size and location of the boundary, and then to work towards the MOU so that by the time that the boundary is ready to go, the revenues can be um, collected and reinvested. Next slide, please. Um, and it's important to note that the revenues collected within an individual boundary need to be reinvested in that boundary. So all the revenues collected, the incremental uh, growth collected in this East Chicago boundary have to be reinvested back in this boundary. It can't be reinvested into say Michigan City's uh, transit development district boundary or or dyers or, or another community, they have to be reinvested back in this. So that's really important to know because it really does promote the local economic development opportunities. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're gonna kind of shift a little bit to how we've been working to get to tonight's meeting. Um, we've, we're on a four step um, process. Um, we're now at step three out of those four steps. The first two steps you see here really occurred during the early stages of our work the first six to eight months or so. Um, some of this actually does continue on throughout the, the duration of the project, but early on in the project, we really became familiar with the station area, the previous planning that you've done as a community. We took uh, site visits. We understood kind of, um, you know, what we could see on the ground. Uh, we developed some understandings of the market potential. We then worked really closely and continue to do so with the local leadership to listen and learn more about community preferences, um, about things happening today in terms of uh, economic development or, or infrastructure investments that are happening now or slated to happen in the future. Um, and we really um, took that opportunity during step two and step three to vet ideas and understand you know, our impressions um, with the community leadership. Next slide. And so, as we get into step three, this is sort of where we are now. Uh, we're at the end of step three, moving into step four. 
Step three is really where we began to apply the knowledge that we learned early and we began to define a draft boundary. We um, tried to understand how market forces could play a role, how um, site selection could play a role, um, how adjacencies could play a role, what status of the existing infrastructure is. We collaborated with, the, with NICTI on stationary designs to understand how those are changing. That led us to this evening where we do have a draft boundary to share out during this public engagement session. And then we'll be able to, after this evening, update that boundary, make changes so that we can um, get that in front of the RDA for a public hearing, and then ultimately to the state budget committee. So this is uh, one step in the process. And as we began to define the boundary, once we, yes, you can move to the next slide. Once we began to define the boundary, so we learned a lot about the community, um, we took all that into account and, and we um, looked at quantitative criteria, um, things like utilities, infrastructure, roadways, uh, a lot of mapping. We were able to really analyze a lot of mapping, um, brownfields, um, assets, um, uh, walkability, zoning, land use. And we overlaid that with a lot of the qualitative um, criteria, things that you've already planned, your goals, the things that you've stated are important to you, your vision. Um, we looked at um, adjacencies, we looked at context, equity, um, things like that to really help round out the more quantitative and analytical side. And then we drilled down ultimately to more area specific uh, criteria as well. And the next slide does a good job of explaining that. So we combined all those factors and when we get down to the sort of the site uh, level, this is where we're really looking at parcels and we're looking at them by a parcel by parcel basis to understand uh, the applicability to uh, being included or not in the TDD boundary. So we look at things like acreage, how big of a site, how little of a site, how close is it to the station? Um, what are the existing conditions? Are the, is it a brownfield? Is it vacant? Is it publicly owned? What is the existing zoning in place? Um, is, it, um, is it a large piece of ground that has multiple owners or, or, or single owners? Um, and so we look at all of these factors on a parcel by parcel basis because they really help us to understand if sites are, are good candidates or not to be included within the TDD boundary. We combine that with the quantitative and the qualitative information to develop a draft, um, a draft boundary. And um, even though the boundary is big, 320 acres is a large area, as you can imagine, and we certainly don't think that everything in that 320 acres would be redeveloped. Um, we think that within the boundary, there is a broad spectrum of economic development activities that can occur over a long period of time, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Some of those activities can be very minimal, like we could be preserving areas because they're already strong. We want them to be included because they're gonna help strengthen other areas around them. Sometimes it's a case of reusing good assets, adaptive reuse, buildings maybe that are vacant today but could be put back into good use. Other times we wanna strengthen, maybe there are good components to a neighborhood or a community, but they could be strengthened. So by further investing in those areas or just around those areas, we can take a strategy of strengthening. Other times there's a really strong, dense urban framework or fabric or um, in place where a quality downtown or a quality district, much of it is intact, but there are gaps. And we call those opportunities for infill where we can go and strategically think about new development in those gaps. And then lastly, there might be large areas of ground that are vacant. Maybe they're somewhat contaminated. Um, we have areas like that in East Chicago that we'll talk about. Those are good candidates for redevelopment where they can be transformed from a non-utilized status to something that could be very, um, very critical to the growth and to the uh, overall health of East Chicago. So those are the strategies that we look at. We don't think any one of those is the right fit for the entire boundary. So we'd like to consider all of those as possibilities for different areas within the 320 acres. Next slide, please. That takes us to the point where we begin to now pivot and talk specifically about 
the boundary that we've created this evening and want to share out with you. We want to do that by kind of walking through our impressions first, how we got to this point. And for that, I'm going to turn over my colleague, Aaron Kowalski, and he's going to walk you through the next couple of topics. Aaron. Thanks, Eric. And thanks, Richard, for the great introduction as well. You know, I'll start by saying, you know, our goal kind of going into this process is to understand as much as we can about East Chicago. And, and we worked really hard uh, hand in hand with East Chicago leadership and staff to learn as much as we can over the, uh, the period of months and, and over, over a year that we've been working here. And so, you know, we first start with, you know, demographics, trying to understand, you know, the makeup of the people that live in the community and not only looking at maybe an area of a little bit more zoomed in, so a mile or so around the station, but then the community as a whole and trying to understand all the different quantitative and qualitative aspects of the folks that live in the community, as well as the things that are really important to the people of East Chicago, both today in the past and as they look to plan to the future. We mentioned a little earlier, you know, we've really drilled down on previous planning and community economic development goals. These are goals that came from the city of East Chicago. And, you know, we've really thought through these uh, set of six goals as, as we've put together kind of our thinking caps uh, to really think about an economic development boundary and really the art of the possible, what economic development growth could be anticipated in this area. So things like attracting developers, new businesses and employers to East Chicago, aggressively enhancing the city's profile, highlighting available resources, you know, such as utilities or transportation, things that the city is doing really well today. And, uh, and really using that as a way to continue to attract people to East Chicago, managing local revitalization projects and redevelopment ventures in a way that makes sense. It's something that the city does quite well today and is really proud of. Work to retain and expand existing businesses and accelerate the, the pace of, of growth and business within the city. So reflecting on all those goals, we've also reviewed a number of really good plans that the city has put together over the years. And we'll start with the comprehensive plan, which really focused in on the whole community, but then dialed in on kind of the area around the station and Indianapolis Boulevard. And, and we've really looked to understand as much as possible through this previous planning about what new land uses could occur, how to position the East Chicago NICD station in a way that could improve the Indianapolis Boulevard corridor and allow for more businesses to grow in the area, as well as look at opportunities for new employment and housing. Going down kind of one step further, kind of zooming in a bit more, we know that the, the Roxana neighborhood did a plan a couple years ago in conjunction with the city. And so understanding their priorities, understanding you know, how the station fits in the context of this strong neighborhood uh, that has a strong identity and, and is you know, really a stone throw away from the station, but then also understand, you know, some longer term goals such as transportation and mobility improvements, walkability improvements, both to the station and up Indianapolis Boulevard, looking at, you know, establishing Roxana Marsh as a, a nature and recreation amenity, things that are really important to the neighborhood, gateways, you know, this is a key gateway and a prime gateway into East Chicago. So these are all things that, that we keep in mind as we're putting together kind of this economic development boundary is where are the opportunities that are shown in some of the previous plans? And then, you know, what fresh ideas, you know, have been brought to the table by folks such as Ball State University, my alma mater. And uh, so we know that Ball State came to East Chicago a number of years ago and did a really um, pretty great charrette that was really energetic and came up with a whole bunch of really interesting ideas. And we've really worked to learn as much as possible through the lens of this previous planning um, kind of throughout the years as we kind of set the foundation for the work that we're going to show you here in a moment. So drilling in a little bit more on analysis, you know, we've done a lot of what we call inventory on our own. And we've looked at things like economic development districts and incentives, things that exist in the community today. We've looked at a kind of a mix of existing land uses. So what's built today as well as what would the city like to see in the future? Things like current zoning, you know, there, there may be an opportunity through this process to um, think about an economic development boundary. And then in the future, the city may want to come along and say, gosh, maybe we need to rezone this area to a certain use 
to really help us to achieve our economic development goals in lines with our plans that we've adopted and completed as a community. We look at things like walkability and really trying to optimize the walkability to this station from both the Roxanna neighborhood and from areas to the north. And so that plays into thinking about mobility planning and what are the needs of the community to allow for better walkability, better traffic flow, safer crossings and things like that. And then landowners uh, is another key component of this process. We're looking at, you know, where there might be consolidation of private property, as well as consolidation of public property or property that may be vacant. So that takes us to the process in which I'm going to highlight kind of our boundary. And we'll, we'll start out with a little bit of a teaser of the boundary, and then I'll walk through step by step how we arrived at that boundary in a graphic format. So before we do that, just to, to kind of bring this up on the screen, just to orient people once more. So if you can see my cursor, here's the East Chicago station. And really we're, we're focused on an area that is a bit irregular in shape, but is, is in general kind of within a one mile area of this station and within the city of East Chicago. Cause you, if you know uh, the Carroll Street, Michigan Street border um, is very close to the station. So we've really focused kind of north into the city. And again, another zoom in. So that gets us to, you know, thinking about the scale of this place. And in planning ther terms, we, we like to think about areas from a walkability perspective. And so you see these two circles. This is walkability as kind of the crow flies um, in a lot of neighborhoods that have sidewalks that may have a grid format. Uh, you would be able to walk this distance. And there's a lot of places in East Chicago that are quite walkable and are kind of that traditional neighborhood type development. We also look at things like floodplain and understanding what properties can and cannot be developed in the future. So that helps us to understand, you know, some of our constraints as well. What are additional things that maybe we need to consider or pull out of a boundary or maybe even consider as a future park or recreation amenity. So that gets us to the draft boundary. And again, I'll walk through kind of how we arrived at the boundary in a moment, but the draft boundary is 367 acres. So it's, it's about 47 acres above what's allowed by statute. And as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, we'll be working uh, to capture input tonight. So if you have thoughts about things that should or shouldn't be included in the boundary, please let us know. If there's things we haven't thought of, please let us know as well and we'll do further investigation. And then we'll be sitting down with community leadership and staff kind of step by step over the next week or so to go through all this information together and kind of fine tune this boundary. And you'll see here kind of the area in yellow in, is in general kind of the boundary. It's a bit irregular in shape, but it's mostly a corridor approach following uh, the station property to the south and then really going up the Indianapolis Boulevard corridor to Chicago Ave and then kind of ending north right around City Hall. This also captures some of the industrial properties uh, along the Indiana Harbor Canal. As we look at forming a boundary, you know, the first thing that we always like to think about are what are the anchors? So what's important to the community? What are things we need to protect? What are things that we need to enhance? And so thinking about things like City Hall, like Veterans Park, public libraries, schools, uh, areas like that that the community finds really important that we may want to include in that boundary because there could be an opportunity as this economic development district uh, kind of gets into fruition and, and funds become uh, generated in it, those investments could occur in these areas. We also look at places that are, are commercial in nature. So, you know, there's a couple of major commercial areas that we've investigated as part of this process. And those are up on Indianapolis Boulevard, Chicago Avenue, and then down, you know, further south on the boulevard uh, near the East Chicago station where there's kind of a small commercial area. And how, how can those areas be strengthened if they were in a boundary? and what economic development incentives could occur, as well as what opportunities might exist for business owners both today and tomorrow to work with the city and with the RDA to you know, have a positive impact. Residential areas, by and large part, we understand that a lot of the residential neighborhoods 
around this area are pretty stable in nature and and there's been investment and then the city has some wonderful programs to encourage investment in those areas as well um, so when we think about residential in this area and we think about incorporating it we were pretty uh, surgical in our approach looking at areas along the indianapolis boulevard corridor that could be incorporated into the boundary as well as perhaps some redevelopment sites up on Chicago Ave that, that should be considered as well. And through this process, I should mention, we also looked at the neighborhoods further out and um, you know there is an opportunity. So the initial boundary is 320 acres. That boundary by statute can be expanded um, to one square mile or 640 acres at a point in the future. So as this district gets going and as funds get generated in it and, and as their positive momentum, uh, the city and the RDA may elect to expand the district to capture areas kind of around it and surrounding it for further stabilization. Industrial areas are a really important part of the equation here. As you all know, um, there's a lot of industrial properties kind of in and around this part of East Chicago. And there's a lot of industrial properties that have opportunities for redevelopment that are either on the market or vacant or you know, may have um, opportunities for reinvestment if they're a, kind of an ongoing business. And so we've been looking into that as well as we're thinking about this boundary. I mentioned earlier, you know, vacant, underutilized, or publicly owned land. That's sometimes what we call low-hanging fruit. It's really um, pretty simple often. Um, if a city has acquired property either for redevelopment purposes um, through the redevelopment commission or um, through other purposes. Maybe they have some park property or they have some property that was uh, purchased as part of a, a utility agreement or something like that. And, you know, so we think about those areas in terms of, you know, where could further investment occur? And then we look at things like vacancy. We look at utility property and really try to take those things into the equation as well. I talked a little bit about previous plans. You can see kind of in orange here and in green, some what we call areas highlighted in previous plans or additional areas of interest. And you know, we, we wanna make sure that these things are included in the boundary because these are priority areas that have been you know, emphasized by the community. They've been part of a community process. So you know, things like the Rock Santa neighborhood, um, portions of Indianapolis Boulevard, all these areas that have been emphasized in previous plans really important to the community and important to thinking about economic development opportunities in the community as well. So that gets us to what we call our composite draft boundary. And as Eric mentioned, there's a ton of research that went into this, but hopefully this graphic exercise kind of helps you to understand the different pieces and parts kind of on the ground that we've looked at to really devise this boundary along with leadership and staff from the city of East Chicago. And again, the 367 acre boundary that I highlighted a few moments ago. And if you have questions, um, as we're kind of rolling through this, the Q&A box is open. So please do ask those questions and participate in the survey. And as we mentioned a little earlier, you know, there's a number of different zones. So TIF districts uh, was one thing that Eric was talking about earlier. You can see the, a TIF district in pink and there may be an opportunity um, to kind of work with that existing TIF district and actually improve upon or extend the life of that TIF district or um, kind of work around it. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility with this boundary that, that we're looking to create here. And then there's something called federal opportunity zones, which um, is kind of driven by census tract. There's a number of them selected across the nation and uh, there's favorable opportunities for developers to come in and get tax credits and, and uh, deferred taxes and things like that, that can be an incentive along with other things like this TDD district to help for development in the future. With that, I'll turn it over to Eric to talk about complementary community growth. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, stay with us for another five or 10 minutes here. We'll wrap up and, and we'll move on to questions. <clears throat> we only have a handful of, of slides to go through here, but um, as Aaron talked about the community, how, how the community was formed and the boundary um, has been shaped, we understand, as I go back to a, a, the, the concept I mentioned earlier, we understand there's a lot of different types of, of economic development activities that can occur. 
Um, when we talk about new development, some of that certainly could be infill development along Indianapolis uh, Boulevard, um, where there is already a pretty strong fabric there. Some of that um, could be new development on vacant ground. Um, we could see a lot of mixed use development in the commercial corridors with ground floor spaces that are more commercial oriented and upper floors that are uh, more residential oriented. Certainly we can see a variety of different types of housing um, as part of your, your community growth over time. Um, things that are maybe more vertical, um, multifamily and things that might be you know, more um, uh, single family oriented. Um, and so we can see a lot of different types of, of uh, development occurring within the boundary, depending on where, where that growth does occur. Um, again, we don't think that there's just one type of thing that can happen here. Here you see a number of different ways you can look at residential uh, development. And then employment is a, is a big opportunity, specifically for East Chicago along the, the, heart of the Indiana Harbor Canal, uh, repurposing ground that um, has been formerly industrial into maybe light manufacturing, industrial office, other kinds of uses that do support employment um, and do take advantage of the status of that land um, and recognize that there are gonna be some limitations to how that land can be redeveloped over time. And so there's a great opportunity to really build the employment uh, base and, and uh, consider those larger uh, areas for development like this. Um, and so with that, as the next slide um, comes up, again, we, we don't think that there's any one solution that could be applied over the whole 320 acres. We want to make sure that we convey that there are multiple different types of uh, economic development activities that can occur throughout the boundary. Uh, next slide, please. And that's all to just wrap up with the overarching statement that again, um, we're really trying to help uh, the community form a strategic um, opportunity to support and complement the economic growth that you all envision with this boundary. Um, so really do participate, help us understand if we're on the right track. Next slide, please. And as a reminder, um, if this is a lot of information, I know the maps that we went through contain a great deal of detail. Um, I'm sure that you'll want to look at these again. You'll be able to find content on the webpage, uh, www.nwitdd.com. And you'll be able to peruse at sort of your own pace and, and dive deeper into certain topics and learn more um, through the presentation we've given this evening, but also just additional information that is up on the webpage. So please do visit and encourage friends and family to do so as well. We wanna make sure as many people um, can be involved in the process as possible. So as we wrap up, um, we wanna remind you that the gallery is um, available at East Chicago City Hall. That's where you can go and, and look at uh, printed out materials, large format boards that are um, uh, positioned in the, in the City Hall. You can read at your own pace there. Um, that's also um, in Spanish and English versions. Um, you can also participate in um, online um, interaction. The website I've mentioned a handful of times now, please do visit that. Um, as far as what we will do next, um, pending the comments and the feedback that we get from you all this evening and continued conversations with city leadership, we'll refine the boundary. We'll get that prepared to present to the RDA board so that they can then hold public hearings. Those two public hearings would be conducted um, and that would allow us to take the uh, final um, boundary to the state budget committee for their review and, and, and approval. And that would be our last step of the process. So, um, so with that, I, I think we're now ready to um, look at the questions and answers that, that you might have. Um, we'll, uh, we'll take them as they come in. I think uh, we'll begin looking at what those are. Looks like right now we have one question. Um, the, the question is, uh, what efforts will be made to encourage application of universal design principles in compliance with ADA, Rehab Act, et cetera? Uh, really good question. Um, 
I, I will say that in our process, we're focused on creating the boundary itself, the detailed design of, of the station area, as an example, is being worked on under a separate process with NICTI. I know that they have to comply with um, the American, uh, American Disabilities Act and are incorporating all of the applicable codes and, and guidelines that would, um, that would uh, uh, provide universal accessibility. And I'm, I'm, I know that any other public project that would happen in the future also uh, would have to comply with ADA uh, guidelines and, and uh, Indiana uh, building code. Um, the next question is, can new mixed uh, income housing focused on workforce be included in a live work format? Um, yeah, there's, there's ultimately a lot of different combinations for how housing can occur in any given community. Um, your community, I'm sure, will be um, approached by interested developers at some point. Maybe that interest is already occurring. Um, those developers will bring to the community ideas for different types of housing, different types of commercial opportunities. Your own community planning will help guide developers to what you would like to see uh, occur. Um, and if there is a focus on the mixed income housing, as you suggest, uh, we're seeing that in a lot of different communities, actually. Uh, the live work format is another um, very flexible uh, product that a lot of uh, communities are integrating into their communities. Uh, so I would imagine that's a conversation that as a community, you're, you're likely having already with your, your planning. Um, your future planning efforts, and then as developers uh, show interest, I'm sure those will, those will happen as well. The next um, question is, can Roxano Marsh become a riverfront liquor district to encourage new restaurants in Chicago? That's a really good question. We, um, we're not focused on, on that level of planning in this process. I can say that um, that opportunity is being leveraged in a lot of different communities. Uh, to encourage not only the new restaurants, but supplemental and sort of complementary development around um, the commercial development. And so um, that's a good question to pose and, and something that the community maybe has already considered or are considering or could consider in the future. But um, certainly we wouldn't be going into that level of detail for this particular study, uh, but it is a great question. Can parks and trails be improved and built with these funds? So uh, the, the funds are, uh, th those sorts, sorts of improvements are eligible for, um, for a reinvestment with the revenues collected um, in the TDD boundary. Um, things that are going to support economic development, uh, be it roads, trails, open space, incentives um, can all be, um, eligible for the use of the funding that is uh, the incremental growth that is captured within these boundaries. So it's a good question. Um, this question next, um, I'll probably defer to Aaron. The question is specific to uh, a portion of the boundary. The property south of Goodman Park on the east side of the canal was left out. Um, why was that the case? Um, Aaron, you might know that off the top of your head. And you might, if it's helpful to bring up the um, the map, you can do that as well. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure why that property was left out of the boundary, but I will tell you that when we meet with leadership, we'll take a look at it again. And uh, we'll also try to get an answer to that question up on the website along with our Q&A. Yeah, good question. Um, we'll, we'll definitely follow up on that. The next question about the, the images, the images are meant to give a sense of the scale and the, the character of potential development. So, you know, not necessarily the materials or, you know, the ways in which they've been designed on a detailed level. So um, take the images with the grain of salt. They're really hoping to demonstrate the range of development opportunities, not specific development, um, specific development proposals or characteristics that would be um, implemented. Those certainly would be a part of, um, as we mentioned earlier, local zoning and land use control is always um, with the local community. That control stays with the local community. So 
um, you know, as projects come through and they are vetted and reviewed by, um, by staff and approved, um, things, things of, of the nature that you're referring to here in this question with the character and how they're built are certainly functions of, of that review and approvals process and the permitting process of individual projects. The next question or comment here is um, the, I think it says the Grand Cal is dirty. Can environmental cleanup be paid with TDD money? It's economic development brings dollars in. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, we, we haven't obviously set out to understand the priorities in the community where the community would want to see the reinvestment happen. I think that's a future step um, once the boundary is formed. Um, the next step would be for the community to really begin thinking about the types of activities that they want to consider um, to be uh, eligible for the reinvestment of revenues, um, whether they're new streets, upgrades to streets, upgrades to utilities that will help uh, encourage and, and uh, support new development, uh, upgrades to uh, open space or trails, or maybe even some environmental considerations. All those things are going to be um, decisions that the community will have to think through. And of course, there are limitations. Um, the incremental growth will, will be very helpful to um, reinvesting in the community and to bring in a new uh, private sector investment, but there will be limits to how much uh, incremental growth is captured, of course. So uh, the community will have to prioritize which of those things are, are um, most important. Uh, the next question here is, will NICTI build a parking garage in the future as demand increases? That's um, certainly a, a great question, one that um, is probably better geared toward NICTI, but um, we can say that, you know, as, as uh, we've seen growth happen, not only, um, you know, in neighboring communities across the border, but around the country, when, when there is demand um, for development, um, parking lots do um, have the opportunity to be converted into other types of development. And, and that parking obviously still needs to be provided, but it can be provided as the question poses in a vertical format, that's certainly an opportunity. Um, that opportunity would certainly have to be um, conversation with NICTI in the future as that demand does increase. But um, if, if uh, that demand does happen over time, then that would be a great sign for East Chicago and other communities as well. If we can start to see that degree of interest and development intensity around the station area, it's certainly um, the proximity to the station itself really is is a uh, is key to that question. So good good question. And I think we are. Is that that looks like maybe one more here? Uh, I echo this next comment. Thank you to Richard, <laughs> not only for your service to the community, but everything you've done and the, and the rest of the leadership has done too, in helping our team uh, understand East Chicago and help us um, be on the right path to where we got to tonight. Thank you. And we're still um, maybe seeing another couple of questions pop in here, maybe. Um, this next one is, what new kinds of housing um, are being built around stations across the US. It's really interesting. There's a diversity of housing happening, um, you know, from, I would say, uh, smaller format, uh, multifamily to um, condominium to duplexes to what we call quads um, to um, small lot, um, single family to cottage homes. Uh, all these are sort of different, different housing types um, because what we see happening in a lot of communities, um, particularly around transit, is that we've, we've got a, a good amount of single family housing that's been there for a really long time. And we also see an influx of multifamily housing, three to four story multifamily housing. But what we don't see a lot <clears throat> is what we call the missing middle. 
it's all of that stuff that I just mentioned in terms of duplexes, quads, um, cottage homes, um, fourplexes, um, things that are maybe a little bit in between. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, a traditional single family. It's not necessarily a traditional multifamily development. So we're seeing a lot of interesting housing product being built around station areas that really cater to different um, market demand opportunities and allow folks to have new choices, quite frankly. Maybe they're not quite ready to go from, you know, downgrade from um, a single family to uh, a multifamily apartment. Maybe they want something in between. And so this missing metal is providing really a great um, new set of housing choices that don't exist and, and really um, fill in a gap in a lot of places. So that's what we see happening in other station areas. And, and certainly some of the images we showed earlier kind of demonstrate the range that could happen that maybe are appropriate even in East Chicago. That's a really good question. Thank you for that. And I should say too that 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 um, is really spans a spectrum of of uh, you know uh, price point as well, and so it's not just about the product and how big or small the units are, but price points. We see a great range and diversity in that as well. So um, so it's really positive and and um, and supportive, I think, of a lot of communities' goals and aspirations. These are good questions. I appreciate the, uh, the direction and sort of the in-depth conversation here. Um, as I mentioned, we typically do get questions about the, the design of the parking areas and what kind of upgrades are happening there. And I, I know that I mentioned earlier, those are best uh, sort of geared toward NICD or, or at least asked to NICD. So um, if you do have those questions, feel free to, to reach out to, to NICD and, and see if you got uh, you can get the answers that you need there. Um, and as Aaron mentioned earlier, there's a great, you know, East Chicago is one of those communities quite different than some of the other ones that we're working in, where there's, I think, a tremendous um, difference from area to area in terms of what exists there today and the kinds of uh, development opportunities that could be presented in the future. Um, in some communities that we're working in, um, there's a lot of greenfield or undeveloped land um, or predominantly residential areas that um, don't offer the same spectrum of development opportunities as we see here in East Chicago, which is great because um, with that comes, we think, good opportunities for employment and building the employment base. Okay, I think we're Wrapping up here, um, no more questions are coming in, which is pretty typical right after eight o'clock or seven o'clock local time, we start to see the questions taper off. So this, um, this uh, is typical of other meetings we've had. So we do appreciate um, your input this evening. We appreciate you carving out time to be with us um, and to participate. Uh, we do encourage you to Again, visit the website, go see the gallery, um, promote that to friends and family, um, get the word out, um, be able to participate and get us more feedback as, as you are, are able to. And then um, also, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be working continuously with local leadership to refine and incorporate comments we have heard tonight. As Aaron mentioned, we're currently a little over the, the size that the boundary can be, so we'll need to carve some things out, that's okay. Um, so we'll, we'll begin to take that next step. So with that, I just wanna say thank you for everything that you've been able to help us with this evening, your participation, and I will turn it over to Sherry for any remaining uh, comments she might have. Great. Um, yep. Thank you, Eric. Um, so yeah, with, with that, I would just like to say thank you all for your time and participation tonight. The RDA wants to continue to address your concerns to help you uh, better understand the coming economic development and social benefits 
um, and really to relay the message that a TDD complements the economic development and growth path of your community to help support the kind of growth that you um, you as a community would like to see. So just like Eric said, we do want to hear from you. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to comment tonight or you thought of uh, more comments or questions, please view our website, nwitdd.com. Uh, and also just read up on information that we have about the proposed TD, TDD locations. And uh, I would like to say a special thank you on behalf of the RDA to the East Chicago uh, leadership, especially uh, Mr. Milton Breed. He is um, our RDA uh, board member, and I know that he was Zooming in tonight. Uh, so thank you um, for your uh, participation and your continued collaboration. Richard morris um Doug Powers, Sandra Favella, Frank Rivera, I saw that you were Zooming in. Um, Jim Bennett for your continued partnership um, and leadership. And we, we really do look forward to our ongoing collaboration with the city uh, of East Chicago. So thank you all tonight and looking forward to hearing from you all to make this a uh, successful development process. So I think that's it. All right, we're signing off. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>